Clay was starting to have a good time. He broke free with his right hand and grabbed the knife in his own chest by the blade and pulled it out. He killed two of these men, and the other three ran away. They hauled Clay out, took him to uh, a hospital. The next day, the papers announced that Cassius Clay had died. But he got better. And he announced that it had been so much fun picking on these uh, pro-slavery rallies that he was going to add to the pleasure by becoming a Republican. Now remember that in the days before the Civil War, the Republican Party was a new party in the South, uh, a party perceived as being radical because the radicals who opposed slavery, who wanted the immediate incorporation of the slave as an equal in American society, they were Republicans. And to find Republicans in the South was extraordinary. In fact, Lincoln didn't get a single electoral vote from any southern state. He was not even listed on the ballot as one of the choices in 1860 here in Virginia. So for Clay in the early 1850s to announce himself a Republican was itself a provocative move. But that's the kind of thing that Clay uh, thrived on. Having announced himself a Republican, Clay then walked into a, another pro-slavery rally, walked up to the front, pushed the speaker out of the way, stared for a moment into, its, uh, into the eyes of his audience, and then reached into his pocket, pulled out a copy of the Bible, slapped it down to the podium, and said, for those of you who believe in the laws of God, I have this argument against slavery. And then he said, for those of you who believe in the laws of man, I have this argument against slavery. Reached into his pocket, pulled out a copy of the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, slapped it on the podium. And then he said, for those of you who believe neither in the laws of God or the laws of man, I have this argument against slavery. And he pulled his bully knife and proceeded to deliver his speech without interruption. Now, Clay, uh, during his life, made one contribution to world literature. Uh, wishing to place himself alongside such greats as Thoreau and Cooper and Walt Whitman, Cassius Clay wrote a book. I wanted to read you an excerpt from this book so that you can understand the literary giant that was Cassius Clay. The book that Cassius Clay wrote is called, quote, the Technique of Bully Knife Fighting by Cassius Clay. I'll read you an excerpt. The first move you should make upon your adversary is to obtain a headlock with your left arm and then drive the blade very viciously back of the left clavicle, thus severing the jugular. Now, you frequently run into an agile adversary who thwarts this maneuver but under no circumstances must you shift to the chest walls as I used to do before I became experienced. There's too much danger of hitting a rib. The thing to do is to shift and drive to the hilt on a line with the navel. It almost invariably puts an end to the encounter. Cassius Clay, the technique of Bowie knife fighting, his contribution to world literature. Cassius Clay also started his own newspaper there had been an incident in uh, Alton, Illinois, where a man named Elijah Lovejoy had had his printing press destroyed four times and eventually himself killed by a mob for daring to print articles, even in a free state, critical of slavery. Cassius Clay decided that that might well be a good way to pick a fight. So he started his own newspaper called The True American. And remembering what the mobs had done to Elijah Lovejoy, Cassius Clay put his newspaper on the second floor of a sturdy brick building. He put iron doors at both entrances and an iron door to the second story shop where he kept his printing presses. And just in case you were able to get past his iron doors and come up his stairwell and get to his front door, he placed on the second story of his printing shop two cannon which he filled with horseshoes and nails and aimed them so that they pointed chest high on the stairwell. And in case you got past his cannons, around each of his printing presses he had stacks of shotguns. And then in the four corners of his building, he placed big barrels of black gunpowder. The fuses came out of those barrels, went up through an escape hatch to the roof. So if you got past his doors, if you got past his cannon, if you got past his shotgun, 
He sent the climax of the roof, light the fuses, and blow the whole hunting shop to pieces. Cassius Clay was able to experience freedom of the press through this mechanism. Now, you may ask, what does this have to do with Russia? What does this have to do with diplomacy? Well, when the Civil War broke out, Cassius Clay was ready for a fight, because now he could do legally what he'd been doing illegally for years, carving up slave owners. As one contemporary account <coughs> describes it, one day as Abraham Lincoln <coughs> drove out of the grounds of the White House onto Pennsylvania Avenue, he saw a motley conclave of two or three hundred men in civilian clothes with new rifles on their shoulders marching vigorously out of step. And at the head was a big tall fellow also in civilian clothes but with a big bowie knife on his belt, and who looked indeed as if he were spoiling for a fight. <clears throat> Cassius Clay stopped President Lincoln coming out of the grounds of the White House and demanded to be made a general in the Union Army. Lincoln was not an uncompassionate man, and to make Cassius Clay a general in the U Union Army and turn him loose in the South was probably the 19th century equivalent of first strike with a nuclear weapon. But neither was Cassius Clay a man that liked to hear the word no, and Lincoln realized that. So Abraham Lincoln commissioned Cassius Clay a major general in the Union Army, and then he looked for the farthest spot on this planet where he could send this new major general, and he made Cassius Clay the American envoy to Russia. Get him out of here. Well. As strange as it may seem, Clay was the perfect choice as an ambassador to Russia. Russia was still something of a rough and tumble society. Cassius Clay seemed to fit right in. Uh, Clay <coughs> not only was a good ambassador, uh, Clay probably was influential in convincing the Russian czar that the Russian fleet should come to America. Certainly Cassius Clay took credit for that himself in his memoirs. Strangely enough, the Russians loved Cassius Clay. And now that he was a diplomat, he carried what he called his dress-up bowie knife. And he discovered that Russian aristocrats owned serfs. And as it turned out, they were not too much different from American slave holders. The plantation owners of the South and the planters of Russia were much alike. Plus, he discovered, Russians grew up fighting with swords. And they liked that sort of thing. <coughs> and these suave Russian swordsmen are much more fun to fight with Bowie Knives than the American aristocrats who really don't have that kind of background. So.